March 11th marked four years since COVID-19 was declared a pandemic by the World Health Organization. The world has never been the same. All of us have stories of COVID, many of them drenched in sorrow. The pandemic was also an eye-opener as millions realized how policies enacted over decades had destroyed the abilities of health systems to deal with a pandemic of this scale. Across the world, health workers emerged as heroes, but it is evident that they had been and continue to be starved of resources necessary for their work. Four years later, what is happening with COVID? What are the lessons we learned from those difficult years? Rather, did we learn those lessons at all? We go to Anna to find out. Anna, thanks so much for joining us. Four years after COVID-19 was officially announced, of course, the crisis had begun much before that. And in the months after uh, the 11th of March, we saw, of course, something that took over the entire world, became a part of our consciousness in so many ways, uh, changed life drastically for many, many millions of people. But uh, four years into uh, this official announcement, what is the situation with COVID-19 now? We know that, uh, of course, while it does not occupy the same space in the media, nonetheless, a number of cases are, there are no, still a number of cases being recorded across the world. Yes, so um, I'd say that right now we're uh, in a weird space where we do know and we are getting the information that uh, while the um, while the disease continues to spread, although of course in uh, much uh, much lesser amounts than than before, uh, at the same time there is a notable fall in the attention it's getting. Um, but of course, you know, if we look uh, at news from only a couple of weeks back, we know that uh, in the in the past four years, COVID nineteen uh, has killed over seven million people. This is something that can uh, cannot be ignored. Uh, and that's definitely something that's going to stay uh, stay with the global health uh, community for a very long time. Um, right now, you know, we're, we're also still uh, in the midst of the discussions on the pandemic treaty, of course, something that Jotna, Jotna has talked about uh, in, uh, in on previous occasions. And this is something that uh, that's kind of a constant reminder that uh, many of the questions that COVID-19 has raised remain unresolved uh, and uh, without the commitment of uh, of the whole uh, of the whole world uh, it's very difficult to imagine that they will get re uh, addressed in uh, in an adequate way anytime soon so this is something that uh, you know it's definitely it's definitely going to stay what we are also seeing is that um, as uh, the attention falters we are also seeing uh, many countries changing their vaccine regimes so if if we look back at only a couple of years back you know there was uh, there was a, a very um, very big hype uh, if we can put it that way about people getting vaccinated about getting all the follow up doses that that are required uh, and many high income countries are now reverting on those steps so they're uh, reconsidering uh, the the policies that they have been pushing uh, at the beginning of the pandemic and of course, this is also something to consider in the light of the fact that many of the people in the global south uh, are still unvaccinated. So it's not like uh, you know we have vaccinated the world and now we have achieved what uh, what we wanted to achieve in, uh, at the first place. So uh, minimizing the risk of COVID nineteen spreading and killing people, uh, but essentially we have. I would say uh, come to to a point where global uh, where high income countries sorry uh, feel more comfortable uh, about the position that they are in right now uh, and are again not thinking about what people in uh, in other pa parts of the world are are living through and the risks the risks that uh, it, uh, this might bring bring to them. Right, Anna. I think a key question we uh, everyone still has right now is that four years down the line, what are the kind of lessons that we should have learned, I mean, have we learned them is a different question, but uh, just maybe uh, say bring back some of those uh, key arguments from that time. What were some of the key lessons that we learned from this pandemic regarding how our health systems were structured? Okay, so um, the list is very long, I would say. <laughs> if we were look at, uh, at the number of lessons that the world could have learned from COVID-19, it would be an amazing thing if we would have implemented all of those lessons. Uh, but of course, uh, we are still struggling with uh, with uh, with kind of the unwillingness of one big part of uh, of those playing playing a role in global health governance about addressing those. So um, it also should be said that uh, you know the lessons that COVID nineteen has brought up. It's not like they they were unexpected. It's not like we didn't have any signs that things like this could happen. Uh, it's just that the big pharma companies that the 
uh, high income countries, governments were unwilling to take steps of precaution and to support the world in addressing and meeting such pandemics uh, in an adequate uh, in an adequate way. Uh, instead, what we have seen is uh, essentially what I think many scientists, many health actors in the world had uh, had dreaded for a very long time, uh, and that's that. Uh, the low-income countries, even the middle-income countries, uh, they did not have enough resources mm -hmm. to meet the pandemic. And that was because they were, uh, the World Bank, the IMF, uh, many of the other philanthropic capitalist uh, organizations, that had, they had forced measures upon them that essentially weakened their public health systems and that uh, made it impossible for them to respond to the pandemic in, in a good way. Of course, this is also true for some parts of uh, the global north, but uh, the impacts of this are much, much larger in the global south if we look at it in, in the broader sense. Uh, this is something that definitely is one of the major lessons right. of the of the pandemic. So uh, instead of devaluing the public health systems, we need to see more money coming into them. We, see, we need to see the uh, public health budgets increase, not to decrease, as we're seeing still in many countries, including Kenya, which is now struggling with, uh, with the aftermath of, uh, of such uh, austerity and neoliberal policies. Right. The second major thing I think we have learned from the pandemic, or at least we hope we have learned from the pandemic, is that the pharmaceutical model that we have in place does not work. So bringing in the intellectual property, as again, many people have warned from before, it does not work. It does not allow for access to essential medical products to the people who need them. And this is something I think that the COVID-19 highlighted through positive examples of how things can be do done differently. Um, so from my point of view, uh, what Cuba did during the COVID-19 pandemic is a major lesson. So this is how things can be done and how things should be done. Uh, it's not necessary to give billions of dollars to big pharma co companies uh, instead of investing in public research and development. It, so public research and development of medical products does work. It can be rooted in solidarity. Things can be shared. They do not have to be sold. So um, this kind of mix of both positive and negative lessons is, I guess, what marks the fourth year of COVID-19 now. Right. Thank you so much, Anna, for that update. European Union countries have agreed on a set of rules that seek to regulate the conditions of gig workers among the most exploited of workers today. The rules seek to determine when gig workers would be considered employees and establish criteria for the same. Now, the discussions around these rules have been quite controversial and there are allegations that the latest draft was diluted. We go to Anish to understand what is at stake. Anish, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, an interesting law and an important one considering that this is an issue that, are, that is being faced by workers across the world. There is hardly a single country where uh, what are called gig workers are not exploited. Many places protests have been st staged massively as well. So first of all, what is uh, this proposed legislation? What does it seek to do? Yes, yeah, so it essentially seeks to uh, regularize and recognize uh, gig workers as regular employees. Uh, and it kind of like one of the key aspects of it is that it kind of puts uh, the onus of proving whether or not they are uh, employees uh, or not uh, on the on the online platforms or on the digital platforms that employ them, essentially speaking. Uh, it also uh, kind of set out a couple of criteria, a set of five criteria, actually, uh, of which if two of them are valid, then there is an automatic recognition of the said employee or the said worker to be recognized as an employee of the company rather than as a contractor, which is what uh, many of these people are, uh, you know, currently recognized as under different kinds of laws, national laws across Europe. Uh, this is quite significant in uh, one way it is that the fact that millions of workers right now will uh, receive the kind of recognition that they need to uh, raise the kind of struggle that they have been uh, waging for years now uh, to uh, you know gain the same kind of benefits that other workers uh, have in their own respective countries uh, uh, you know putting in same amount of work actually uh, so in retrospect uh, they might be entitled to uh, uh, say minimum wage laws, pensions, other kind of uh, work safety protections. So once you are deemed as akin to be an employee, you are actually deemed as to be eligible of various sorts of protection that labor laws of Europe, which are generally far more advanced than say much of North America, 
or many other Western or OECD countries, uh, it kind of gives them that sort of set of rights that they have been denied for so far. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, there are some technical uh, uh, ambiguity that is uh, uh, that uh, still exist. The kind of compromise that has gone through uh, to actually get this thing happen uh, and uh, is, is still, you know, creates a lot of ambiguity on how this uh, bill is going to be enforced uh, in the next uh, after two years, which is what the timeline that they have given. Uh, once all countries start enacting uh, similar kind of laws, uh, once the EU uh, enacts it uh, in its own level. So we have to wait and see how these technicalities are going to uh, pan out right now. But definitely, uh, it is at least one step forward. Whether or not it's two step backwards is a different question at this point in time. And Anish, just wanted to ask you about what are some of the criticisms that are being leveled against, against it? There is, for instance, the argument that it has been diluted as well. Yes. So the earlier uh, uh, locks uh, sort of set out to uh, enforce a sort of uniform uh, legal framework for gig workers across Europe. Now that has been diluted. One of the that is that has been one of the biggest uh, contentions from countries like France and Germany, uh, both of whom uh, were not uh, in favor of have governments that are not in favor of recognizing gig workers as regular workers. Uh, or employees to begin with, uh, and you know, pretty much beholden to the digital platforms that they uh, that they're protecting. Uh, so many of them want a sort of national level laws to be legislated first for these laws to for these protections to be enacted, and that is where the ambiguity comes in. How uh, you know, because it is just a set of framework we are looking at right now. Uh, it is not a legal set of, and it, which is something common for EU uh, legislations. Uh, but it is not the same kind of thing that, like, the, it is more diluted, more vague, more broad. So a whole host of things can be added in the manner in which, uh, you know, each country is, uh, would enact it. Even right now, what we are looking at uh, by the estimates given by the European uh, Commission itself uh, is that of, of the 28 million, it will only affect about 5 million of the gig workers. So clearly showing that a large number of uh, gig workers are still going to be excluded under different technicalities. Uh, again, the criteria, the fact that, like, it, it has an auto-triggered criteria, but definitely the fact that uh, the employees, employers can actually uh, raise these things in national courts and get the employees uh, de-recognized as workers, as employees, uh, is something that still concerns a lot of people. Uh, and pretty much uh, can can have its own set of ne negative impact in the long run for the struggle for gig workers. Thank you so much, Anish, for that update. And that's all we have in today's Daily Debrief. We'll be back with a fresh episode tomorrow. Meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all the social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button.